Oldenburg, Germany, Field Marshal Montgomery's plane crashes against a tree. Miraculously escaping death, the Field Marshal is rushed to 16 Canadian General Hospital. Although badly shaken, after receiving first aid, he insists on keeping his appointment with the Canadian Army Occupational Force. The Canadian Armoured Corps Band provides the music for a grand inspection and a presentation of awards for gallantry. Before the officers mess, on the lawn overlooking the beautiful Vixenon Lake, medals are presented. DSOs go to Lieutenant Colonel Henderson, to Major Tedley of Montreal, and Major Weber. MCs go to Captain Walker and to Captain Kylie. CQMS Morrow and Rifleman Butcher receive military medals. Despite his narrow escape, Field Marshal Montgomery carries on with the job in another plane hastily requisitioned. You can't keep a good man down. Toronto, an uproarious welcome is accorded Canada's 11th winner of the Empire's highest award, the Victoria Cross. In a token ceremony, Captain Geary, last war VC, pins his own medal ribbon on the six foot two paratrooper who will be officially decorated later. The 27 year old Skyborne medical orderly won his award for outstanding heroism with the first Canadian paratroop battalion on their jump across the Rhine. Brothers compare notes on the army as Toppy tells of his experience. Well, Fred, how does it feel to win the VC? Oh, it feels wonderful. I think it's a great honor to me and to my unit. I'm very proud to belong to the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion. I won the VC today, and by strange coincidence, it's just three years ago today that I joined the army. Mom and Dad are mighty proud of their gallant son, Corporal Topham, VC. In London, British brides of Canadian servicemen gather at a convention sponsored by the Wives Bureau. Two delegates from each of 40 clubs throughout the United Kingdom register at the official opening. Tags are made out for each girl in true convention style. Lecturers talk to the new Canadian citizens on the subject of household science. Notes taken will be valuable later on. Many subjects which will be of use to the wives in their new homes are discussed. Red Cross personnel give demonstrations of cooking the Canadian way. At a fashion show, Red Cross girls also model typical Canadian clothes. Mmm, galoshes and woolly. Well, one day all these pretty ensembles will hang in the bride's wardrobes without the ceremony of clipping the coupons. At a cocktail party given at Oceanic House, the girls have the opportunity to get acquainted with each other and with their host and hostess, the Honorable and Mrs. Vincent Massey. The convention is a huge success. Each girl now knows a lot more about the Canadian way of life. Ten Canadian boats are at the starting point in Amsterdam for the international yacht races. Hollanders invite members of the Canadian Sergeant's Yacht Club to enter the competition for trophies. The nautically minded members of the Army show their salty qualities in the keen competition. The event is the first of its kind held in the Netherlands since the occupation by the Germans in 1940. It is sponsored by the Winkenveen and Avkuta Yachting Club. The time for the race is two hours and ten minutes for the small boats and one hour and four minutes for the yachts having a handicap. The Canadian crews acquired their boats from collaborationists who were not loyal to the Netherlands government during occupation. They were confiscated and became booty of war. With them, the seagoing sergeants win one first, one second, and one third place in the Amsterdam regatta. for the first event at the Van Damme track near Groningen, Holland. 
With weather clear and track fast, the old gilders are going on the nose as betting wickets are stalled. Reminiscent of the fall fairs back in Canada are the sulky races, which provide the crowd with thrills and many a near spill as the trotters fight it out for first place under the wire. Several of the army hunt clubs have favorites entered in the flat races. They are all well backed at the paramutual windows by their supporters. The entries from the Maroon Hunt Club are solidly supported as the starter takes them away in the feature flat race of the day. With Gunner Babington up, the winner Trixie gets a hand from his proud trainer, Sergeant Paisley. <laughs> Leaving Scotland's port of Greenock, the Ile de France steams toward Canada, packed to the gunnels with happy troops homeward bound. General Creera, commander of the 1st Canadian Army, is as happy as the rest to be on his way home after a job well done. Life on the ocean wave agrees very much with the general, who is awarded the freedom of the bridge. As the ship nears Halifax Harbor, a grand welcome is given to all the returning warriors. General's wife and daughter are overjoyed at seeing the head of the Creerar household once again. They share with him the joy of being welcomed with the keys to the city of Halifax as he steps ashore. General Creerar chats with a group of his own boys of the 1st Canadian Army wounded in action. At Moncton, as well as all the stations down the line, huge crowds greet with thanks the returning army chief. At Union Station in the nation's capital, Prime Minister Mackenzie King makes the welcome official. The Guard of Honor is from the new Canadian 6th Division, mobilized for the Far Eastern Campaign. Parliament Hill, a ceremony of welcome is held. Citizens and government officials witness the greeting by the Prime Minister. General Kerr, assembled here on Parliament Hill this morning are representatives of all the governments of Canada and of the countries allied with Canada in the present war. Many who represent other aspects and activities of our national life are also here with thousands of your fellow citizens all to welcome you home on your return, the valiant leader of a victorious army in the greatest of the world's wars. There is special joy and satisfaction in bidding welcome here on Parliament Hill to a soldier of world renown, one who is also an honored citizen of Canada, one of our very own. Mr. Prime Minister, <clears throat> I am deeply moved by the tribute which you have paid to me. While I do not feel for a minute entitled to accept it in a personal sense, I can do so with a clear conscience on the basis that this represents your feelings toward all ranks of the 1st Canadian Army. If during these years I have carried out my responsibilities to the officers and men I've had the great privilege to command in a manner which they and the people of Canada consider to be up to their expectations, then no one in this world could consider himself more amply rewarded than I do at present. Yeah. 